following interview was, was conducted with Lynn Doyle for the Purdue Uni uh, University Periodicals for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 17, 2008, Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us where you were born and your parents and early years. I was uh, born in Indianapolis, and my parents, uh, Carol and Francis Miller, and my it, it, Carol was my dad. Francis was my mom. They both had uh, names that could be go either way. Uh, I was born in 1945, December 3rd, and grew up um, in Speedway, Indiana, which is a town that's surrounded by Indianapolis. And I lived there my entire um, grade school, high school. I graduated from Speedway High School in 1964. Tell us and a little about the grade school and also what you did in high school. Things okay. Like yeah. Um, my husband tells me that it, if anybody asked me what I majored in, in college or in high school or anything else, that it should be activities because that was always my favorite thing. If I was... Um, in high school, I did. I was an English major, and um, with a pre-college uh, degree, I was in a, a really interesting program that they started in Speedway. They have abandoned this this whole concept. But in seventh grade, they there were about 150 of us in seventh grade. At seventh grade, they took 30 of us out, and we spent our whole high school, our our middle school and high school years together. Um, it, just the 30 of us in advanced type classes. And that began in seventh grade. Um, it was interesting because when I went back to one of my reunions, uh, one of the guys I went to school with came up to me and he said, you know, I never talked to you in all the years we went to school because we never had classes together. He was um, not in the 30. He was not in the 30. And this 30 people, that's basically, it, and I really, um, it, there were some good parts of it and there were some really bad parts of, about it because unless you would skip a study hall and take a class outside of study hall, which I did some, you really didn't get together with other kids. The only place where you did was in uh, P.E., and uh, in band, or choir, and I was not in choir, so I was in band. And then, uh, so I, maybe that's why I joined so many outside organizations, so I would get to know other people. Through the years, in other words. Through the years, sure. yeah. Um, I, was, um, I was editor of the high school newspaper, The Speedette, and um, like I said, I was in the band, and we did a lot of what things. What instrument did you play in the band? I played the flute. And then I, I twirled, and I was a flag bearer. And because I was the shortest one in the, in the twirling group, I always got to be the checkered flag. Since Speedway is all about racing and everything. Um, For the we, researchers, that's where Indy 500. Yes, Indianapolis 500. We, um, our, our band carried the, all the flags that they use at the Indianapolis 500, the caution flag, the green flag, the red flag. And I always got to be the checkered flag because I was the shortest one. So Very good. And, um, and I was, uh, one of the other things I did, I was in Girl Scouts uh, throughout my, from, from Brownies until Senior Scouts. And I stayed in that because we sort of had a, um, a carrot at the dangling for us that between our junior and senior year in high school, we planned a trip to a dude ranch in Colorado. So we took the train. There was one chaperone and eight girls that I think we all stayed together. And uh, we went to a dude ranch for about 10 days. Wow. And it was, it was incredible. And I think that was one of the things. Um, my parents, my dad uh, worked um, for an automobile dealership in Indianapolis. He was a parts manager. He got two weeks of vacation. He had to work Saturday mornings. We did not, when I was young, we didn't get to go on too many vacations. We, we went to Florida twice, and that was, that was about the extent. We did have a cottage up on Lake Freeman. So that was nice. We would go up there on the weekends. And um, 
So that that was great, but we really didn't travel outside too much. But being able to go to Colorado when I was in high and school and on the train was, too, what yeah, cool. and on a train was was pretty cool. Sure. Do you have any brothers or sisters? I I have a half sister. Um, she is ninety years old, young. Uh, she's very young acting. She still lives in her own home. Her husband is um, I, in next month. He'll turn ninety two. Um, where do the, where they, do they live, live in Georgia now. They had been living in Florida, but um, they really <clears throat> needed a smaller home, so they moved up. My uh, niece lives in Georgia, so they moved up closer to my sure. niece. And um, so it, being as much older as she is than me, um, I really didn't grow up with her, but we, that was one other place we would go. My sister, most of the time, I was uh, still at home, lived in western Illinois where my dad grew up, so we would go go sure. there. But um, she lost her first husband, her first husband passed away and then she remarried and now she's been, I think they've been married for about 25, Very good. 30 years now. Okay. So after high school then, where did you, you came to Purdue, but how did you decide on Purdue? Uh, well, I didn't come oh, to Purdue oh. first off. I went to Hanover College okay. in um, Hanover, Indiana for a year and a half. Um, I decided on that. I, I volunteered at um, our church when I was in high school, and um, I think our minister was, was very instrumental in, you know, at least introducing the concept of of going to Hanover, which is a Presbyterian college, to me. And I really liked the idea. Uh, Hanover has a, a, a little bit different system. They have two a little bit shorter semesters than we do, and then they have a six-week period where you only take one course. And that, Like in the winter, perhaps? Uh, it January? was in the spring. spring it was okay. in actually in May. And that appealed to me that you would just focus on one course. And it was the travel thing again. Um, I took geology my first semester, and we went to um, New Mexico and Arizona. So um, good field that trip. Was, yeah, yeah. And um, it it was a great school. The professors. I mean, early on, you had full professors teaching your classes. But it was very small, 1,100 students. The uh, college newspaper came out once a week. There was a yearbook. That was about um, as far as any kind of activities to do with writing or editing. That was about the only things you could do. Um, Did you learn how to do residence hall there? I lived in a residence hall my first year. I lived in a sorority my second year. Um, and. Then it was really nice um, when I transferred to Purdue because I really wanted a larger campus. And what I did was I went uh, one year and one semester at Hanover, and the semester was over at Christmas. And then I had already decided I was going to transfer. And so I took classes at IUPUI in Indianapolis and just lived at home for w one semester. And um, that was also a very interesting experience. It was before IUPUI was a campus like it is now. The campus was very spread out, and the Purdue part of the program was out on East 38th, 38th Street. 38th Street near the fairgrounds? Is yes, right across from the fairgrounds. Right. And not in the best neighborhood, but it wasn't bad. But I, I did, again, I had very good instructors. I um, took... Um, a zoology course at the 38th Street campus that was fantastic and it was again it was either an associate professor or a full professor who was teaching the class and the English classes that I took again I had you know very right. you know uh, tenured faculty teaching right. me. Excuse me, this is before it was separate, was Purdue was separate and IU was separate, is that correct? Was yes, that but I, IU, PUI? yes okay. but I did take my English classes at um, the IU campus. Okay. But I'm just clarifying it, for the yeah, research. It right. counted at Purdue. Sure. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then in at the beginning of my junior year I came to Purdue and 
um, I moved into the same sorority then that I had been at what at Hanover. Was that? Alpha Delta Pi, which is no longer on campus, uh, but it was it was a great place because um, well I had come up during the spring semester and met a lot of the girls. Um, and really liked it. I liked the location. It was on Russell Street. And um, a lot of the people in my sorority house were involved in the Purdue Exponent. And I knew if I had connections there, I could probably get on the staff of the Exponent pretty easily, and which I did. And uh, so I came to, that would have been 1966. Okay, yeah, okay. 66, yeah. And so then I was, I, I finished here at Purdue. Tell us about some of the activities and things. Were you on the Exponent? Yes, I was on the Exponent, and I was on the Exponent senior staff. Um, I was, I was uh, lucky enough to be selected for mortarboard. Uh, I was in Gold Peppers, which was a spirit organization, at, at, um, which is no longer here. I, I, since I was not a freshman when I came, I wasn't able to do Block P, but I'm sure if I had been a freshman, I would have joined that. Um, I, I was uh, selected for Delta Rho Kappa, which was sort of the forerunner to Phi Beta Kappa. They didn't have a Phi Beta Kappa when I was here. Uh, I was in Kappa Delta Pi, because I thought for a little while I thought I was going to go into education and teach English. And um, I got uh, to be a delegate to a national convention that was in, in Denver, in Kappa Delta Pi. I was in Women in Communications. Um, no, no band. Uh, didn't pursue the music at all. I didn't pursue the music. I should have pursued the twirling, but I didn't. Uh, but I think once I got to college, I think... I found out the exponent was going to consume a lot of time because you you go down there they they had at that sort time there was in the basement of the union for the yes, researchers not yeah. a separate building. Um, it you would have activity hours and so if you had certain activities they wouldn't schedule you, you classes after three o'clock in the afternoon. So basically, I go to down to the exponent and be there from three o'clock to nine o'clock. I might run back for for dinner or something. But sure. you know, it was it was a really interesting time at the exponent too because when I was at Purdue, it, it was we were starting to have a little bit of unrest here. Not only a, a little bit it was of it was about Vietnam, but more of it was about tuition was actually going up, which was unheard of back then. I mean, now it's a regular thing for tuition to go up, but back then um, it was a, a big deal. And um, I was actually on the senior staff that selected um, Bill Smoot as editor of the Exponent, an editor who I think got fired or booted out for using bad language in the paper. But Bill, I have to tell you, he was our um, he did our editorials when I was on the senior staff. One of the best writers and most, um, his thinking process, his, his commitment to education and, and maybe trying to open people's eyes about things like diversity and um, the facts that that students could have a voice. Um, it, those ideas were a little bit before his time. More, more open, and in other words. It, he was much more open. And um, but but I had the chance to be on uh, the senior staff with um, Tom Leslie, who is the grandson of Governor Leslie. He was on my senior staff, and and, and we just had a great group of people. And uh, we worked hard, we played hard, and uh, it was, you know, sure. it was a lot of fun. It right. was pro it was definitely my favorite activity, and right. and that's what made me realize that that's really what I wanted to pursue as a career. Okay. Did you ever think about the degree? How was the degree doing in that time? That the degree? the degree was doing great. Right. Um, I liked I liked to be writing two or three stories a day, and 
uh, on all. the debris, it was a more of a long-term thing that you couldn't see. I loved getting up in the morning and, you know, seeing what I wrote last night in the paper today. And the instant gratification thing, the debris is a lot, much more long-term. Uh, in high school, I did edit our our high school yearbook, and it, it was fine. I loved doing that, and that's when I found out I really liked doing layout. So the career I went into where I had a chance to combine both writing, uh, editing, and then being responsible for how the publication looked at the end was, was a perfect match for what I like to do. Sounds good. Okay. Now, tell us about then after you graduated from Purdue, you stayed on? I, uh, yes. When I graduated, from, I graduated in January of 69. That was back when the semesters were a little bit different. And because I had transferred, I needed an extra semester. And um, so I graduated in January of 69, and I went to work for Purdue in March of 1969. I took two months being a, uh, uh, I had gotten married in August of 68, and my husband was still in school, and he was working on the staff also, but going to school at the same time, because he's, a, he's uh, younger than I am, and um, so I was going to be a housewife for a little while and, you know, just look for a good job. And um, it just happened that my husband's um, boss knew Herb Schaller, who was the director of the Purdue News Service. And um, Dave Schumann was my husband's boss, and Dave found out about they were going to have an opening over there. And it was sort of a, a new job. They wanted just somebody to come in and write about student news and um, they thought somebody a little bit younger and everything uh, could come in and do that so sure. I started doing that in March of 69 in May of 69 um, there was a retirement well not a retirement she left the university the lady who was doing campus copy the publication for employees she left and um, Herb Schaller said, why don't you try this? He sent me to some photo editing classes and some, you know, layout classes and, and stuff like that, but I did all the writing, the editing, and the layout on campus copy, so that became yeah, my we'll job. Talk a little bit. Herb Schaller, could you make some comments, because uh, he's, is he still alive? At all? Well, this is interesting. We were talking about that last Thursday, I got together from with some people, Bob Topping among others, and we think Herb is still alive, but nobody's heard from him. He lives in Colorado, and I have not heard from him for about six years. So not sure. I'm not. Did he sure. did he retire from the university? Uh, or he left? He left, went to another job oh, okay. out in Colorado, okay. and then retired after that. Okay, okay. Then who took over from after? He, you know, he was, was News Service, did that include the publications? Oh, no, okay. no. News Service and publications were, were separate. Okay. And Bill Whalen, oh gosh, I don't know when Bill came to the university as university editor, but, and it was, I think, it was called the editor's office. And then it was called publications. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, but Bob Topping took over for Herb when Herb retired or left the university. Left the university. Okay. So you, um, what were some of the challenges? And, and then we'll talk about some of the publications. One of which is campus copy. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead. Some of the challenges. challenges and what they just I guess about. you know the. The biggest challenge probably was the fact that I was very young and everybody in the el else in the office was very experienced and really knew what they were doing. It was a little bit intimidating. However, because of the people in that office, I did not feel intimidated. I felt very welcomed and I felt like everybody was doing everything they can to help me out. And I worked... Um, when I first came in March of 69, I reported to Meryl Swedland, who um, was the sort of the student editor and uh, sort of a features editor. And um, he 
he and her both gave me just a lot of feedback on things and really taught me the ropes and really put me through boot camp early on right. and made me feel very comfortable. So um, and there, there were just great people in the office. Ken Kaiser, who recently passed away, uh, was the engineering editor. Dick Smith, who passed away last year, was the science editor. Dick, I learned so much about editing from Dick Smith. Um, he was a, a, a wonderful mentor because he edited all the copy in the office. And so you would get your copy back and, and sure, he would right. explain, you know, what, what needed to be changed or anything. And Bob, of course, was, was just a super uh, person to work for because he is so knowledgeable not only about the business but about Purdue. And he's the one I really learned so much right, yeah. about Purdue from in the history. You said that they wanted you to write about the students. What, how, what sort of focus? What we would do... Because there was one the, of the exponent, of course, yeah, published. One huh? of the, the big goals of the news service at that time would to be get, to get stories in all the small town papers around Indiana. Get about the, the Purdue student? name out there. And so one of the easiest ways was to find students. And so I would do news releases about who got in what sorority, and just anything we could think of about a student, and we had uh, all sorts of information on, if a student lived in Fort Wayne, here are the papers that you send it to. So we would send basic releases about what, what student activities people were doing, if somebody got elected president of something, all those little stories. The student voice getting it out. Yes, and it was basically the best way of getting publicity out there for Purdue because it was, you know, it was just sending a news release. It was not free, but it was very uh, low expense. And people would pick it up, especially the weekly newspapers. And so that Purdue name was always just out there because we would we would send out probably two or three releases a day. Okay. Um, very good. On students. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then uh, let's talk... Uh, did uh, did you interact with other within the community, the university community that uh, you were in publications? And I was in the news service until I wrote this down. Um, um, in the news service until 1973, okay. and, and then, that, then I moved to publications because the um, we changed the. Philosophy. That's when we started perspective, and we thought it was better off putting publication periodicals in the publications office because they were more used to working with printers and photographers and things like that sure. than the news service. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, uh, talk. Another one was Campus Weekly that came out, didn't it? When President Hanson, wouldn't that? Didn't they? There was. Um, it was like a. a Flyer or news thing that came there. Up. There was. They they changed Monday Memo a little bit. That's another one too. Yeah, Monday Memo was basically for faculty. Okay. Campus copy was for um, employees, and then we started up Circle S E R C L E. Right. Uh, which was for service and clerical staff. We found that Monday Memo was not did not address anything clerical and service staff really needed to know about. Um, this was about the same time th that the CSAC, Clerical and Service Staff Advisory Committee, came into being. And so... Um, we we thought that it would be good to have a publication pointed toward that audience because the benefits were different. Um, there there were a lot of different concerns. Faculty and administrative staff had concerns over here, and clerical and service staff had had a little bit different concerns. Sure, that's right. And we also had a publication uh, during that time where all the riots and things were going on, and I think it continued. Uh, for about two or three years, it, it was a s publication for students that came out weekly. And then there was a publication for parents uh, mm. that were, was sent to parents. And that was started about the same time, back in late uh, 60s, early 70s. Wow, okay. 
That, how did perspective, how did that come about? Okay, that came about, President Arthur Hansen was, uh, realized that Purdue did not do a good job of communicating with alumni who were not members of the Alumni Association. The only communication with alumni was to send them requests for money or tell them about alumni association trips or something like that. And his philosophy was that we really need to build a base of friends. And he, it, he thought if you built friends, if you built faculty, if you built freshmen, if you recruited freshmen, and we sent perspective to uh, people, all the student, all high school students who had sort of inquired about Purdue, we put them on the mailing list. And so he thought if you would recruit, if you would do those three Fs, then the funds would come as a result of that. If you told people all the great things that were happening at Purdue, that they would just start thinking in their minds, wow. This, this place has gotten so much better since I graduated and they're doing so many neat things. Um, and it was in the first mission statement for Perspective, there was never anything about having any kind of fundraising stories in Perspective. We were, that was one thing we would not do. That was not the voice. That was not, not yeah, the voice. So what to find money to come up to be able to do perspective, um, we, we stopped the student publication, the parent publication, and uh, campus copy. And for a while we were without anything for, we did keep circle. We were in, then we had Monday Memo, so we were without sure. something that did more feature type articles. Right. Perspective on only came out, did it just come out monthly? It came out, uh, it first came out six times a year. Oh, it was okay. bi monthly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. And now it's down to either three or four times yeah, a year. That's right. Yeah. Now let's talk about how about Inside Purdue? Talk about that publication. Inside Purdue, um, basically we were we were finding that because we didn't have sort of feature stories on um, faculty and staff happenings that, that we really wanted more about that and we also felt like it was time that everybody came together rather than clerical and service here and faculty and administrative here. And so that was, uh, let me see, I think 89, it, 1989 is when we started Inside Purdue. And, but then, prior to that, it was called Purdue Today. Then we, ch we changed the right, name exactly. of it. Right. Yeah. And you were in charge of that too as yes, well. Yeah. What sort of staffing did you have? You know, where did the staff uh, come from? <clears throat> when we started Purdue Today, it was, it was Bob and me, uh, Bob Toppy. And uh, we uh, would use news releases from the news service, but basically we wrote everything else that was in the publication, and then um, I laid it out, and um, it was printed. I think when we first started printing it, it was printed in Frankfurt, at the Frankfurt Times. Okay. okay. We went off campus to print it. We've had many printers over the years, but I'm pretty sure Frankfurt was the first one. Right, okay. And how was that received pretty well? Yeah, it really was, because I think, especially clerical and service staff, had started to feel like they were being left out of the loop, that there were not things being hidden from them, but they would see Purdue today in the campus mailboxes, and especially the secretaries who made, you know, put it in the boxes would, would read it first and uh, say, oh, well, there's stuff in here. And, and that was really, I, I think, between the administrative and, uh, and professional staff advisory committee and the clerical and service advisory committee, both those groups, we did some readership 
uh, survey type sure. things, some right. research. We had some focus groups and um, decided that that for everybody's best, for the best communication for everybody, that right. that would be the best way to did, go. Whom did you report, who, where did uh, an organizational chair, where does publications fit in, whom did you repeat the report to? We reported to, uh, well, Bill Whalen reported to Joe Bennett, okay. Vice President for University Relations. Okay. And then News Service was separate, though, was it? Uh, news Service reported the same place. Now, when, when Joe first came, Joe was reporting, the News Service reported directly to the President um, through their director. And I, you know, I honestly don't remember their publications, who Bill reported to. For a while, it was Development Office. Back when the Development Office first got started, Lynn Buckland. And I think that's where publications was reporting until Joe Bennett became, yeah. So he came on board. And that's during the vice during president. Varying years. Right? Yes, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. When, okay. when he became vice president for university relations, then publications, news service, and uh, visitor information center all reported to Joe. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Uh, how about liaison with the uh, Purdue? Did you have any liaison with the alumnus at all? Uh, we would, yeah, we would go to each other's planning meetings, and especially when Gay Totten was the editor, and then uh, Tim Newton, and um, I think it dropped off some, and and I think Sharon became editor, Sharon Martin became editor after I did. But there's still some communication. I mean, we would always send our story lineups because we didn't want to duplicate information. And if we were working on the same stories, we wanted to take them from a different angle. Sure, exactly. So right. uh, we didn't want people to feel like they were, oh, I just read that someplace else. Right, you know. exactly. And then you had some, what about the external media, the Journal Courier? Did you send news releases? How, what was kind of any relation or li liaison with the external media? Uh, back when I was in the, the uh, news service, yes, yeah. Okay. There was a lot okay. of that. But once we moved over to um, publications, all I did was hire people away from the Journal Courier. <laughs> uh, Jay Cooper Ryder came from the Journal Courier and Julie Rosa, who um, when, when we uh, started the Office of University Periodicals became the fourth division under University Relations in 1993. And Julie and, and uh, Jay were, the, and I were the staff. Yeah. Do, also, do newspapers call you for t news at all? Was there any contact, or were they called the news service? Uh, because, um, because Jay and Julie both had worked at the Journal Courier uh, once they were on staff. A lot of people would. And uh, Bob would always get calls from the Journal Courier just because people would would thank Purdue, they thank Bob. And, um, and again, the community was born and raised here. That's yeah, probably important. Yeah, and so, yeah, and, and, you know, I would try to refer things always to the news service. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know Carol Banger and stuff. So, you know, okay. yeah, if she yeah. calls for something, you're going to give it to her. And, you know, that was really the thing I took the most pride in, in especially when we, we broke away and, and periodicals became its own office, is that we, no matter who called or sent emails, no matter how off the wall they seemed to be, we would respond to those things. And we would answer our phones ourselves. Um, you know, I think people anymore get real frustrated about never getting a real person on the phone. And that was one thing that we always wanted to have was a live person answering the phone and getting back to the person right away. Right, exactly. And, you know, it, in the end, there were a lot of things that, that came of that. I think the um, Dick Shively, the money for the press box at um, Ross Aid, 
a lot of that was a call that Jay Cooperwriter answered in our office one day and started talking to Dick and then build up a relationship with yeah. him and everything. Yeah, right. And I, you know, I, it, um, when, when President Hansen talked about building friends, I think that has continued through the whole area of the periodicals. You, you know, sure. we just want to be a friend-making organization for the university and, and you be know. Be out front doing that. Yeah. You, right. Yeah. What about the impact of technology to that as far as the printing and processing and things of that was a lot? It's, it, it is huge compared. I mean, it used to be, when I started out, you sat at a typewriter and typed out your news release and then made marks on your paper and gave it to a secretary to type. By the time I retired, I would, you know, if you wrote a story, you would make all the corrections and you would lay it out. We used to have, we used to have somebody type this in and they'd give us galleys and we'd paste them down on paper and everything. It is a much, uh, to me it's a much more exciting process when you're uh, part of the process from the beginning to the end. I think Some so. people don't like doing that. They'd rather just sit here. Putting it all together and then see the finished product. Yeah. 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 Very and, nice. and you feel like, and I'm a little bit of a control freak, and you feel like you are in control. Right. Exactly. Yeah. If a story needs to be cut a little bit, you can just sit there at your computer and cut it. Um, it the thing that I wish, and, and we did start putting things on on web pages, we started putting all the periodicals on web pages by the time I retired. But the thing that I really um, think I missed out on was now that we have Purdue today, which is every day. That to me would be the most exciting thing yeah, to do. That is key. I like that. Yeah. I, I check it every day. Yeah. yeah. We talk about a couple of writers. You've mentioned Whalen and Topping, but another one's with Richard Pierce and Oh, Chuck Dick. Yeah. yeah, Dick Pierce uh, was the associate director of uh, publications uh, for many years, and um, he, you know, people in the the news service went about their work a little bit more noisily than the people in publications. The people in publications um, were very quiet about how they did things and you know wouldn't uh, make a big deal of things but but Dick uh, edited things for the admissions office and did so many things for so many different departments around campus but you would never know <laughs> that Dick did them because he would he did his job he did them very professionally and he never made a fuss about it Bill was the same way I mean Bill um, Bill Whalen. Bill Whalen. Right. Yeah. Bill would give you a job to do, and then once a week we'd have a staff meeting, and he'd check to see how it was going along. If there was anything he could help with, he'd want to know that. But, you know, if you were doing your job, he was not one to walk down the hall and say, you know, well, how's this going? How's that going? He just – and I think he hired good staff. He hired staff that he trusted, and he trusted that they would get the job done. Sure. And he didn't need to look at every publication before it went out. Uh, he'd occasionally look at things if he was sort of interested in them, but he, you know, he didn't need to, to micromanage anything. Um, Verna Emery was another person who yeah, uh, worked I for her. the... I nice person. Yes, for the right. Purdue Press. Um, the designers in the office were very, in publications, uh, were very key to the success and still are key to the success of that office. Um, Don Carter, who has passed away uh, since I retired, uh, excellent designer and artist. Jim McCammick uh, has been at Purdue since maybe 72. He's designed a lot of the logos, the, it, the things that we just take for granted. Sure. Um,